Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. As many observers argue, China's foreign policy has become more assertive since Xi Jinping became president in 2013. The country once advocating its peaceful rise has stoked worries in many of its neighbors and is seen to increasingly pose a challenge towards America's strong presence in the region. Caught in between are the two Korean states, and especially South Korea, both in terms of its geographic location as well as its political and economic relations. To learn more about China's recent foreign policy and the prospects for the future of the region, we had the honor of interviewing Professor Robert Ross. We discussed the driving forces behind China's foreign policy, what role America wants to, should, and does currently play in East Asia, and the position of the Korean Peninsula in this context. Robert Ross is Professor of Political Science at Boston College, an associate at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies of Harvard University, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He has written extensively on Chinese security and defense policy, as well as on East Asian international relations, in several books and numerous academic articles. He received his PhD in political science from Columbia University in 1984. Professor Robert Ross, welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. You have been doing research and writing on China for more than three decades. What got you initially interested in the country? It was China's long history, its complex culture, and of course, Chinese food. So when I was thinking of pursuing a career that would expose me to the world and give me opportunities, a PhD in China and international politics was a natural. We'd like to start by quoting an article you wrote in 2012 for Foreign Affairs. There you said that China has been, and I quote, maintaining cooperative and friendly relations with most of the world ever since the 1970s. But this has changed a few years ago. Could you briefly explain what, in your opinion, changed in China's foreign relations? A number of things happened. Um, Beginning in 2008, 2009, China suffered the implications of the global financial crisis and experienced considerable domestic instability associated with economic concerns, rise of the internet, weak leadership, and you had a rise in nationalism, anti-American nationalism at the time, because China felt that the West was suffering its financial crisis and this was China's time. It's time to be in the sun, so to speak. And so there was great pressure on the Chinese leadership to adopt a policy toward the United States and its neighbors that was far more assertive and far more proactive, and this aroused concern among China's neighbors and in the United States. But then since then, we entered a second stage where we can really speak about the rise of China's maritime power. In the last three or four years now, we've seen China's ship production rate just skyrocket, the modernization of its navy take off, modernization of its um, missile force take off. And so we now see a far more capable China that's able to pursue its maritime interests with greater force and greater assertiveness. And this is a fundamental change that we can expect to continue for the foreseeable future. Classic rising power, as we say in, in the world of security, capabilities determine interests. And China's capabilities have improved, so we'd expect it to have more expansive interests going forward. You also wrote that we shouldn't see this change in behavior as an expression of China's strength, but rather of, to quote you again, a deep sense of insecurity. Why would a rising power like China feel insecure when it is stronger than ever before? Well, when I wrote that article in 2012, China had yet to experience considerable strength in the international arena, and yet to experience expanded capabilities in maritime Asia. So it remained considerably vulnerable to American power in the American Navy. And the sort of diplomacy we saw at that time reflected more the domestic concerns of a weak Chinese leadership. I don't think we can continue to say that today. It's, it's been a good five years, six years since that time. And in those six years, the expansion of the Chinese Navy has been considerable at a very rapid pace with significant modernization. So we moved from an era of China's maritime vulnerabilities to one of a more powerful, capable China in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea. And so no longer are we seeing a weak leadership, but we're seeing a powerful domestic leadership pursuing more expansive international objectives. At the time, the leadership was led by Hu Jintao. Now, Xi Jinping is in power. How much of this change can be attributed to him and his new leadership? Hu Jintao was a weak leader. He had been selected to be the next party chairman and president of China by Deng Xiaoping. 
So that was his support base, and Deng Xiaoping passed away. So he lost his, his considerable political base, and he was surrounded by leaders who didn't owe their loyalty to him, but to his predecessor, Jiang Zemin. So he was vulnerable to opposition, and so he was a weak leader. And his foreign policy reflected those vulnerabilities for when he experienced um, domestic economic uncertainty, political instability, um, heightened opposition to the party and heightened nationalism, he felt pressures to adopt a more nationalist foreign policy. Xi Jinping is a very different leader. This is someone who came to rise on his own capabilities. He didn't depend on someone else picking him. He defeated all the other contenders for the party leadership. And since he's been in power, he's been very decisive in minimizing the opposition to his rule. And he's also a very confident person, decisive person. And so the foreign policy we're seeing as a result can't be explained by domestic weakness, and it can't be explained by economic weakness. Um, it's explained best by a combination of a very confident, assertive personality with a more capable China. And put those two things together, you're going to have a very dynamic Chinese diplomacy. How has this affected the approach that China has towards its Northeastern Asian neighbors, and especially the Korean Peninsula? We can say that past 10 to 15 years, the rise of China has casted a shadow over the Korean Peninsula. After all, if we look throughout Chinese history, um, when China's been weak and on the rise, the Korean Peninsula has accommodated itself to Chinese interests. On the other hand, when China's been weak and the Japanese have been powerful, the Koreans have accommodated themselves to Japan. So the Koreans have understood, as a small power might, that it has to shift with the winds of great power relations. In the last 15 years on the Korean Peninsula, we've seen the rise of China. That rise has been fundamentally the result of the rise of the Chinese army. Not the Chinese Navy, not the Chinese Air Force, but the greater ability of China to project power, ground force power, throughout the Korean Peninsula. Of course, we add to that the growing vulnerability of South Korea to the Chinese economy, which is the fundamental basis for economic growth in South Korea. And finally, we all expect North Korea one day to collapse. And when it does, there will be unification of Korea under the South Korean leadership. And at that day, South Korea will have a common border with China. We're accustomed to thinking of North Korea as a Chinese buffer state, but we also have to understand it's a South Korean buffer state. So when South Korea loses that buffer state with unification, Chinese power will be felt far more heavily in Seoul, compelling South Korea to accommodate its security to Chinese interests. Now, of course, South Korea is not going to wait until that happens, but has to factor the future into contemporary policy. So this rise of China, instability of, in North Korea, South Korean economic vulnerabilities have all compelled South Korea to come to terms with China's rise. Now, it's been a difficult problem for South Korea, because after all, there is a 60, 65, 70-year relationship between South Korea and the United States. And when the United States and China are great power competitors, South Korea has to manage and navigate between the great powers and accommodate the rise of China, but it's maintain its cooperation with the United States. That's been a very difficult struggle for South Korea. If you look at the last three South Korean presidents, one was working very hard to move closer to China and at the same time diminish cooperation with the United States. It went too far in one direction. The next South Korean president wanted to reaffirm and reconsolidate relations with the United States, but it alienated China. And contemporary leadership, the Park presidency, has done thus far, although we're not quite sure where it's going at present, far more balanced relationship, where relations with the United States have been fairly stable, but it's also made a point of having cooperative relationship with China. We can see that balance and that struggle for balance in South Korean diplomacy, a very difficult process. What has been China's stance with regards to South Korea? Recently, you wrote with Jo Inge Beckevold from the Norwegian Institute for Defense Studies in a book chapter that she might be a strong leader, yet one that faces fundamental contradictions. The most important one of these is, as you argue, that the Communist Party of China and the state of China might have contradictory interests. Could you elaborate on this, especially with an eye on what it means for Chinese foreign policy and South Korea and North Korea? Well, China remains a single-party authoritarian state in that single party of the Chinese Communist Party. And so the fundamental objective of the Chinese leadership is to keep the Chinese Communist Party in power. And that's primarily the responsibility of the People's Liberation Army as well. Um, it is a party army, not a state army. Now, the Chinese Communist Party today feels particularly vulnerable because of the declining economic growth in China and rise of domestic instability 
the growing role of the internet in China. Uh, and so we do indeed have a party that feels itself vulnerable, growing insecurities, and a leadership, Xi Jinping, whose job it is to keep the party in power. Now, to some extent, we might focus on the role of nationalism in Chinese foreign policy. To the extent that legitimacy in China is declining from a less successful economy, poor performance in the economy, the Chinese leadership to stay in power may increasingly rely on nationalism to establish to their people that the Chinese people are taking their role in the world, they stood up, they're a great power, and they won't take insults or pushbacks from other countries in the world. These kind of domestic pressures with a weak government can lead to a more nationalist foreign policy that can be resistant to compromise, resistant to restraint, resistant to patience. And if that's the case, a party leadership committed to staying in power can impose costs on the international system as it adopts an increasingly destabilizing foreign policy. Up to now, we haven't quite seen that. Clearly, nationalism is on the rise in China, and clearly the Chinese people are pleased with Xi Jinping's assertion of China's great power authority. But simultaneously, I think it's important to recognize that much of what China is doing seems to be Xi Jinping's personal agenda as well, so that there is a, a match between what the Chinese people want and what Xi Jinping wants as a leader of a rising power. The concern may develop more so when you have a, a leader who would like to restrain China, to move ahead at a slower pace, but feels unable to do so because of domestic political pressures. Under those circumstances, we'd worry more about domestic politics contributing to a destabilizing Chinese foreign policy. And how would that play out with the Korean Peninsula? As we're watching South Korea today, we're watching the United States resisting South Korea's effort to improve relations with China. The United States is quite concerned about the rise of China, about the growth in Chinese capabilities, and is trying to draw lines in East Asia. Who are American allies and who's cooperating with China? Who will consolidate the U.S. alliance and who will weaken the U.S. alliance? In order to coerce other states to commit themselves to the U.S. alliance, they're putting pressure on those states to adopt policies that are against Chinese interests. And we're seeing that today in South Korea. So in particular, the most high-profile issue on the agenda in U.S.-South Korean relations is the question of missile defense for South Korea. South Korea has long resisted deployment of U.S. missile defense systems. This was an issue not only recently, not just in the Obama administration, but it was an issue in the first term of the Obama administration, and it was an issue throughout the Bush administration. Throughout that period, South Korea made clear that it didn't want to participate, because in so doing, it would be taking sides in U.S.-China relations. Similarly, throughout this period, the United States wanted to pursue what was called a flexible strategy with South Korea. What that meant, the United States could use its facilities, its bases in South Korea, to support contingencies and conflicts off the Korean Peninsula. Well, South Korea understood what that meant. That meant if there were a war in the Taiwan Strait, the United States could use South Korean territory to prosecute that war. Uh, South Korea said, we don't want to participate in flexible strategy because that would mean the use of South Korean territory by the United States against China. Again, we see South Korea not wanting to take sides in the U.S.-China great power competition. The Bush administration decided now is the time to draw the line. They were unhappy with South Korean ambiguity in uh, U.S.-China relations, and the issue for the United States, the Obama administration, was missile defense. If you're going to remain a U.S. ally, if you're committed to the United States, you will accept missile defense in your country. Now, the problems are numerous here. Uh, first of all, it should be clear that missile defense doesn't work for South Korea. It doesn't work because what we call the launch to target time of a North Korean missile is so short that the opportunity for a missile defense system to intercept a missile before it hits Seoul, that opportunity doesn't exist. So here we're compelling South Korea to accept a missile defense system that no way can defend Seoul against North Korean missiles. From a larger perspective, we're also deploying a system in South Korea that doesn't, that's insufficiently tested. So we don't even know if it works anyway. The United States Government Accountability Office has said there has been inadequate testing of missile defense to establish that it could be effective operationally. So here we are doing two things. We're compelling South Korea to accept a missile defense system that, one, doesn't work, and two, if it did work, would not help to defend South Korea. But then the third problem is the United States wants to deploy with this system a radar system that covers more than just South Korea but covers much of China. Well, this would suggest that the objective is not simply to deal with North Korean missiles 
but we want to aim the system at China. Why do we want to do this? Well, presumably we want to integrate the, this missile defense system with the larger web of U.S. national missile defense radar systems throughout Asia and the United States so as to enable the United States national missile defense system to defend itself against Chinese missiles. But once again, this is not going to be effective. A missile defense system against Chinese missiles will be ineffective because these missiles are simply too expensive. and So China can easily overwhelm the system with more of their own missiles. And second, there are so many ways to defeat a missile defense system for China that, again, it would be ineffective. So for all these reasons, we have to find an alternative explanation for American policy. The alternative explanation is to compel South Korea to commit itself to the U.S.-South Korean alliance and basically to deny China the opportunity to expand its own influence in South Korea, commensurate with its rising power. This is a problem for South Korea. They resisted, resisted, resisted until they finally said yes. Clearly, the Chinese are unhappy. The Chinese feel that Korean Peninsula is a neighboring region. They have a profound national security interest in countries on their border that cooperate with them. And here the United States has compelled South Korea to diminish cooperation with China. China's response has been very clear. We told you we didn't like missile defense systems in South Korea. We told South Korea this. We told the United States this. And yet you've ignored our warnings. So now you come to us and you ask for greater help regarding North Korea's development of nuclear weapons and, and strategic missiles, well, that's not going to happen. We asked for your help on missile defense. You said, no, don't ask for our help on North Korean nuclear capabilities. And so we're seeing the breakdown of Chinese cooperation with the United States and South Korea regarding North Korea. And it's quite clear the Chinese are also saying to South Korea, you want our help on North Korea? Reconsider your decision on missile defense. And we're seeing South Korea still struggling. They said yes, but it's not clear what the future will hold. In 2012, President Barack Obama announced a so-called pivot to Asia, and thus a shift of American attention towards the nations across the Pacific. At the time, you wrote that this new direction of American policy is both, and I quote, unnecessary and counterproductive. What led you to this conclusion? Well, first it's important to recognize that Hillary Clinton and President Obama didn't start the pivot to Asia. We can actually pinpoint the date. It was uh, 1999. Uh, that was the year the United States uh, transferred its first Los Angeles-class submarine out of Europe and over to Guam. And this was clearly a case of U.S. efforts to balance the rise of China. We saw Chinese submarines growing. We saw the strength of China growing. We were concerned about the Taiwan Strait. And so we had to increase our presence in East Asia in order to compensate for the rise of China to maintain a regional balance of power. So by the time Secretary Clinton announced the pivot to Asia, the United States had already done everything possible up to that point to move military equipment and expand diplomacy and alliances in East Asia. What we've seen since then was simply a continuation of that trend as new weapon systems come on the line. We move them into East Asia, such as the literal combat ship, such as the F-22 aircraft. Again, a continuation of a trend, which is simply part of balance of power politics and U.S. responding to the rise of China, which in many respects is inevitable. One would expect the United States to do that, to stand still, to fall behind. Great powers are not going to allow a rising power to undermine the regional balance of power. It was the unexpected parts and the unnecessary aspects of the pivot that I was referring to. And here the United States was challenging Chinese security with the pivot in areas that don't relate to American security. And so in this respect, that part of the pivot was gratuitously challenging Chinese security that could only make East Asia and U.S.-China relations worse while not contributing to American security. Now, there are a number of elements to this aspect of the pivot. One was defense cooperation with Vietnam. This is a rather futile effort because Vietnam is so close to China. They have a common border. So that's a Vietnamese bordering 1.3 billion Chinese with a very powerful ground force. So that any attempt of Vietnam to establish independence or foreign policy independence from China would fail, no matter who they cooperate with, and that includes the United States, because the United States can only offer Vietnam naval support and that can't compensate for Chinese ground force presence on the Vietnamese border. So here we were pursuing defense cooperation with Vietnam that would have no upside for American security, but it would challenge Chinese presence on a state right on Chinese borders. This necessarily was going to aggravate U.S.-China relations without contributing to American security. We see a similar trend with relation with South Korea. Beginning in 2010, the United States reversed the policy of the Bush administration. 
During the Bush administration, the United States reduced its troop presence in South Korea by 40%, and it seemed to have no effect on American security. The United States also reduced the size and frequency of our joint exercise with South Korea. And again, it seemed to have no implications for American security. We reversed these trends beginning in 2010 going forward. So during the Obama administration, we have increased, increased the American troop presence in South Korea by 25%. We've held the largest live fire exercises in the history of U.S.-South Korean cooperation. We've held more exercises than ever before. And we've reached new military agreements with South Korea than ever before. The purpose is clear, to respond to the rise of China by establishing American strategic presence in South Korea that will resist the rise of China. It would be a mistake, I believe, to associate these trends with our concern for North Korea's nuclear capabilities, because American deterrence, our deterrence posture of North Korea, is as robust as ever. It depends on the American retaliatory capabilities, South Korean retaliatory capabilities, that would have overwhelming destruction of North Korea and the demise of the North Korean leadership. U.S. and South Korea's deterrent posture has always relied on that retaliatory capability, and it remains as robust as ever. And there's no indication that the North Korean leadership is any more reckless than in prior years. So the reason to upgrade our presence in the Korean Peninsula was to resist the rise of China. And it's important to underscore that since 1945, the United States has not believed that the Korean Peninsula was vital to American security. In the early stages of the Cold War, before the North Korean invasion of South Korea, the United States had already decided that the Korean Peninsula was of secondary importance to American security. The United States could move off the East Asian mainland, it could move off of the Korean Peninsula in Taiwan and Indochina, and still have adequate presence in East Asia to maintain an East Asian balance of power. So a reason for resisting Chinese presence and the rise of China in, on the Korean Peninsula is unclear. We were content during the Bush administration to watch the rise of China establish a greater presence in Seoul. Why resist it later? And once again, the pivots seem to be challenging Chinese security interests without a corresponding effort to promote American security because American security wasn't challenged. All that could do was undermine U.S.-China cooperation without promoting American security. We see this throughout East Asia, similar trends regarding the territorial disputes. The United States, beginning in 2010, took sides in the territorial disputes between the Philippines and Vietnam and China, and between Japan and China, the East China Sea. And let us underscore clearly that these islands have no value whatsoever. They have no strategic value whatsoever during wartime. There are no natural resources anywhere around these islands so that there is no security or economic interest the United States has in resisting Chinese control or claims to these territories. Nonetheless, the United States took sides, clearly supported Japan, seemingly encouraging Japan to challenge China, clearly supported the Philippines, including with its support for Philippines law of the sea claims, and encouraging the Philippines thus again to challenge China. Not clear why the United States did this. These islands have no in importance to American security, and it's clear the United States did not benefit from having countries challenge China over unimportant pieces of territory. One can only conclude that the United States was doing this because it wanted to challenge Chinese security and to establish to the region and to China America's resolve to resist the rise of China. But we did so in areas of secondary importance to American security that could only undermine U.S.-China cooperation, undermine regional stability, but not contribute to American security. In all of these areas, the pivots seem to go overboard, go to excesses, unnecessarily provocative to China, without any gain for America. If the pivot to Asia focused on secondary issues non-vital to American interest, what would be primary security interest for the United States, and what would China be willing to tolerate in terms of U.S. presence in the region? Well, other aspects of American policy are constructive for American security. So beginning in 2010 going forward, the United States conducted negotiation with Japan to strengthen U.S.-Japan alliance cooperation. And in so doing, the United States gained greater logistical support from Japan, greater access to Japanese hospitals during wartime, and reassured Japan that a rising challenge would be offset by greater U.S.-Japan strategic cooperation. This was very important, and this was successful. Japan has maintained its commitment to the alliance and has um, not accommodated the rise of China. We need to underscore that Japan is the most important American ally in the world. 
important. If East Asia is the most important strategic region in the world for the United States, insofar as we have a rising power in a region of vital interest to America, in order to be a presence in Asia to maintain the balance of power, the United States needs cooperation with Japan because only Japan can provide the forward presence for the United States. And so that was very constructive. The United States has maintained that cooperation with Japan that's vital to American presence in the region. You also improved U.S.-Singapore cooperation. Singapore, of course, has the only facility in the South China Sea that can take an aircraft carrier into its port, and the United States has worked hard with Singapore to maintain naval cooperation, and Singapore has become an important facility for American deployment of its most advanced capabilities. More recently, we have increased our presence in the Philippines and reached a new agreement with the Philippines to expand American military presence there. And with Malaysia, we should say, in eastern Malaysia, we reached agreement with Malaysia to carry out ASW, anti-submarine warfare activities, in the South China Sea. What all of these activities have done is they strengthened American presence in maritime East Asia. South Korea is not a maritime East Asia. Vietnam's not a maritime East Asia. Even Taiwan's not a maritime East Asia, so close to the mainland. American interests are, since 1950, have been balance of power interests through a presence in maritime East Asia. So all these steps were necessary to maintain that American presence to maintain the regional balance of power. In contrast to American presence in Vietnam, increased presence in South Korea, or challenging China over worthless territorial disputes. So these were important steps. Going forward, we're still doing that. Um, And will China accept that? Is that acceptable to China as it rises? That remains to be seen. If you look at the world from a Chinese perspective, there are American bases in South Korea, Japan, Philippines, de facto base in Singapore, greater U.S. naval cooperation with Malaysia. This is a string of American access to naval facilities around the entire coastal perimeter of China. As a rising power, China inevitably will oppose, or China will inevitably resist that, because that's simply unacceptable now that China has greater capabilities, that the United States can dominate Chinese coastal waters. And China, as it grows more powerful, will want a larger voice in the South China Sea. It will want a larger voice in the East China Sea. It will be unhappy with America's bases in the region that allow it to challenge Chinese coastal security. So we're watching a classic rising power phenomenon. As China rises, it's going to want more security. And this is in international politics, particularly in great power security affairs, a zero-sum world. If China wants greater naval presence in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, if it wants to weaken America's ability to challenge Chinese coastal security, this will inevitably weaken America's presence in East Asia generally and thus undermine the balance of power in the region that America will find to be a strategic challenge to its security. As China rises, the U.S.-China relationship will inevitably get worse as China's ambitions to have greater security will challenge American security. Let's zoom in on China's relations with North Korea. The country, its behavior, and especially its nuclear program, are a major headache for the United States and South Korea. Do Chinese leaders lose their sleep over North Korea, or is it a relatively minor issue in China's foreign policy discourse, as the two countries, after all, are on relatively good terms? The Chinese are clearly unhappy with North Korea's nuclear program, and for multiple reasons. One, the challenge the North Korean nuclear program poses to the United States and South Korea seems to encourage greater U.S.-South Korean cooperation and greater U.S. deployments in Northeast Asia which challenge Chinese security. If North Korea were more benevolent, less provocative, presumably the United States would not be increasing its security on China's perimeter, and that would be good for China. But that's not all that China has an interest in, not just in reducing North Korea's nuclear program. Even in the age of nuclear weapons, even the age of high technology, buffer states are important. So the United States has been quite pleased with having a secure Caribbean Sea with no great power presence there, having a Canada and a Mexico that cannot challenge American security. China's the same way. North Korea may be a problematic state for China, but having that buffer state contributes to Chinese border security in Northeast Asia. So they don't want to lose that state. And of course, that has implications for unification of the Korean Peninsula. There was a period of time when China seemed to be accommodating itself to South Korean domination of the entire Korean Peninsula. And that was in the context of improving China's relationship with South Korea. But as the U.S.-South Korean alliance has consolidated, and as U.S. presence in South Korea has increased, China is losing confidence 
that a unified Korea under South Korea would not simultaneously mean greater U.S. presence, perhaps, on China's borders. So we can see the implications of China's interest in having a secure border and a buffer state for China's policy for North Korea. They are going to be reluctant to undermine stability in North Korea should that lead to unification and greater presence by the United States near China's borders. So the the leverage China has over North Korea, it's reluctant to use should that lead to instability and unification and greater insecurity on China's border. Now, related to this, of course, is that the threat that North Korea poses is to the South Koreans and the United States. So that makes the status quo far more acceptable to China than it does to others. So for all these reasons, uh, the Chinese are relatively content with the status quo. Now, going forward, if you examine Chinese policy, in many respects, Chinese policy toward North Korea is the most constructive policy of any country in East Asia, and that includes the United States. China has a three-pronged policy. First, it totally isolates North Korea in international diplomacy. It has better relations with South Korea, the United States, better relations with Japan than it does with North Korea. There are no summits with North Korea, minimal diplomacy with North Korea, constant criticism of North Korea, so that North Korea has no misconceptions that China would support North Korea should North Korea provoke a war or act with instability. So there, China's contributing to regional stability. But the second thing China does is it gives just enough foreign assistance to North Korea so that the government in North Korea can keep its nose above water so that the country won't collapse and cause instability, that one, might cause a war on China's northern borders, or two, might lead to unification with U.S. presence north of the 38th parallel close to Chinese borders. But the third thing China does, and this is significant, is it carries out significant border trade with North Korea. And that border trade consists of consumer goods, including DVD players, cell phones, computers, televisions, air conditioners, even automobiles, that all contribute to an erosion of the North Korean government's control over North Korean society. And to the extent that that society develops greater autonomy, it compels the North Korean government slowly and gradually over time to reform reform its economy, reform its political system, leading to gradual change. So, for example, we would call that, in U.S. policy toward Cuba, we would call that engagement, because we believe engagement helps to promote political and economic reform. China's policy toward North Korea is basically a similar policy of engagement. And their hope is that over time, you'll see a soft landing of the North Korean government, placed perhaps by a more reform-minded government, and one that can manage the nuclear problem in such a way that we can denuclearize the Korean Peninsula with a less belligerent, vulnerable, and isolated North Korean government. Put these three pieces together, this is a fairly constructive Chinese policy. A few months ago, we interviewed Bonnie Glazer from the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a think tank in Washington, D.C. She told us, and I quote, that I do think Xi Jinping is running out of patience with North Korea, and that what Kim Jong-un has done, from China's perspective, is just simply be defiant. Would you agree? I would have said that was true until a few months ago. Beginning in early 2016, after North Korea's last um, nuclear test, China and the United States worked well together to pursue sanctions for the United Nations Security Council that were really quite strong sanctions that challenged uh, North Korea's ability to conduct international trade and that challenged North Korea's banking system, an international banking system. And that level of co- cooperation was unprecedented and clearly reflected China's loss of patience with the North Korean leadership and its concern to cooperate with the United States so as to inhibit or forestall the United States from expanding its strategic presence in Northeast Asia. But the United States, as North Korea has developed its capabilities, insisted on deploying the missile defense system in South Korea. So this had two implications. One, it suggested that Chinese cooperation with the United States didn't promote greater U.S. cooperation with Chinese interests, so why should China continue to cooperate? And two, it's quite clear that U.S. efforts with missile defense in South Korea aim to deny China political influence in South Korea. So China's response has been, yes, we may be fed up with North Korea, but we're more fed up with the United States. We may be fed up with North Korea, but we're more opposed to U.S. and South Korea deployment of missile defense in South Korea when we told you clearly, don't do so. So since then, despite China's frustration with North Korea, we've seen China refuse to agree to any more sanctions 
with North Korea, despite American insistence that there be more sanctions. China clearly signaled there will be no new sanctions to the United Nations Security Council. If there were new sanctions, that would require the United States to bring other countries on board outside the UN framework, but China clearly would not support those sanctions. So now we're in a stage where the Chinese say, you want more help? Stop deploying missile defense. I would imagine this deadlock will continue indefinitely until we see the United States reconsider its efforts to strengthen the U.S.-South Korean alliance at the expense of Chinese political presence in South Korea. For the foreseeable future, what would you advise the different leaderships to follow? What policies should they take and what should we expect? Both China and the United States face a common problem. That is, how to manage the rise of Chinese power. This is a problem for both China and the United States. U.S.-China relations were easy during the period of peaceful rise. During that era of China's post-Cold War development, China didn't have a navy. It couldn't reach out across the seas and challenge American security in maritime East Asia. And it was clearly focused on regional stability, cooperation with the United States at all costs as a focus on economic development. In those circumstances, China had an easy foreign policy, stay out of trouble, and the, ch and the challenge was easy in terms of managing U.S.-China cooperation. Now China has to do two things at once. It still needs cooperation with the United States. It still needs regional stability. Heightened U.S.-China conflict could be extremely costly to China, and perhaps unnecessarily so. But simultaneously, now that China has greater capabilities, it's time for China to achieve something, to achieve new objectives that enhance Chinese security. And this necessarily will require China to challenge the status quo. We should understand that China is not a status quo power. It's not happy with U.S. strategic presence and military bases and access to facilities in South Korea, Japan, Philippines, Singapore, Malaysia. And with its new capabilities, it will want greater security, and it's going to challenge the status quo. So the challenge for China is how you use this new power without undermining your first objective of maintaining regional stability and cooperation with the United States. Thus far, China's not done a very good job. U.S.-China relations are the worst they've been since 1971-72, and China's forward-leading diplomacy, its efforts to enhance its security, have contributed to a region-wide perception of China of a country without restraint, a country that's determined to advance at all costs, and if it undermines the security of other countries, so be it. So what China's done with its recent diplomacy under Xi Jinping is exacerbate the threat perception of other countries. It's not surprising that in these circumstances, these countries look to the United States for help, assistance, reassurance that the United States will balance the rise of China and that the United States will see China as challenging American alliances and have to push back hard to maintain its alliance system in East Asia. China has to learn to exercise restraint and patience, allow political change to achieve its results rather than over coercive diplomacy. Patience can allow politics to work, so that smaller countries will gradually accommodate themselves to Chinese interests, just as Vietnam has, just as Taiwan has, just as South Korea has been doing for the last 10, 15 years. A patient foreign policy, a restrained foreign policy, can achieve the same result at less cost. But the United States has a similar challenge. With the rise of China, the United States now has two objectives simultaneously. Life was easy when there was peaceful rise. When China wanted good cooperation with the United States, the United States could do engagement all the time. It could cooperate with China all the time. China could not challenge American security because it didn't have a navy that could cross the East China Sea or the South China Sea. Now the United States, just like China, has to do two things at once. On the one hand, it has to reassure its allies, who are understandably nervous at what seems to be an unrestrained Chinese foreign policy. And you have to signal China that you have the resolve to resist a unrestrained Chinese foreign policy to maintain the regional balance of power and to maintain your alliance system. But the United States has to show that resolve, reassure its allies, maintain the balance of power, expand its presence, while simultaneously maintaining U.S.-China cooperation and regional stability. Because China is also a great power, and U.S.-China conflict can be very costly to the United States in many ways. After all, it has a deep agenda with China, including environmental cooperation, economic cooperation, anti-terrorist cooperation. So should the relationship deteriorate unnecessarily, a wide range of American interests could be challenged. Well, we have to acknowledge the United States has not done a very good job. U.S. policy toward South Korea, and deployment most recently of a missile defense system there, U.S. taking sides in the island disputes in the South China Sea and the East China Sea, its effort to establish defense cooperation with Vietnam, all of these things 
have signaled China that America will resist all across the board the rise of China. It will make no accommodation to China's rise by giving China a larger voice. Well, in these circumstances, the Chinese see very clearly, from their perspective, the United States' objective is to contain the rise of China. Well, China is now at the point where it will not accept what it sees as containment, so it's going to push back against the United States and exacerbate regional instability as it says no, the United States tries to resist China's rise. And so U.S. policy persuading China that American objective is containment has contributed to heightened U.S.-China conflict and hostility as China sees the United States as an implacable adversary resisting China's rise. Going forward, there's nothing predetermined about power transitions, nothing predetermined about the impact of a rising power and great power relations. War is never predetermined. Many things matter in decision for war. So that despite the rise of China, despite the ongoing U.S.-China power transition, the possibility exists for good leadership and good policy to manage this process in ways that can diminish hostility, diminish the likelihood of war, rather than increase the likelihood of war. And what that requires from both China and the United States is to exercise restraint. China has to exercise restraint over how much it wants to pursue and how much time. China thus far has pursued too much too fast, giving rise to regional apprehension. A slower, more patient China can allow China's rise with reduced conflict. The United States has shown no restraint, challenging China in areas that have no interest in the United States, but persuade China of containment. The United States needs to pull back, focus on what matters, maritime East Asia. In so doing, it can at least focus the competition in areas that matter and not give China the impression that America is going to undermine Chinese security rather than simply maintain its own security. We don't know where the United States is going to go in the future. We don't know where Xi Jinping will go in the future. But at current trends, it's fair to say that the opportunities exist to diminish the level of tension in the context of the rise of China. Professor Ross, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.